Honorary Writer Director Hossein Amini, and the cast of the film. I said to Kirsten, I, it should be ladies first, but I always think, uh, as a writer and as you're all writers, we have to give props to the writer in the room and start with the man who initiated this. And Haas, I, fa I think it's fascinating that you first read this patri particular Patricia Highsmith novel, which is, let's face it, one of her more obscure ones, when you were a student. Yeah. And it's been, what, festering in your brain for all these years. What was it particularly about this one that got under your skin and that has, uh, after all this time, has prompted you to direct it? Well, it was, I mean, I, I always loved crime thrillers, but this was a crime thriller about three, I thought, very ordinary kind of characters who, who we could have met and are very much like us. And, you know, the fact that they're thrown into this this world of crime, and it's the damage they do was, was to themselves. It wasn't their outside forces like policemen or criminals or whatever. It was really watching this very intimate triangle um, sort of, you know, the dynamics of it. And, and the characters just stayed with me over 20 years. I kept reading it and rereading it and reimagining them differently. Um, I, I thought Chester, when I reread it, I remembered him being sort of handsome and, you know, wearing a white suit and a bit like Vigo in the movie, but actually in the book he's very different. But I think that was one of the great things about the time it took to write was, was it, it was a combination of, I think, what was in my head and what was in the book. Um, but it's, it's a book I love still. Moving on to Oscar, um, it's a very Patricia Highsmith thing to have a central male relationship with a, like Rydell is almost, almost, I thought, more fascinated with Chester, or alias Chester, than he is with Colette in some way. And I wondered if you had actually thought a lot about the father-son undertones, or if you and Vigo had talked a lot together about the dynamic between these two guys. Yeah, that definitely was very much in the, uh, in, in the book, and in the script, and figuring out you know, how much does he start with this? Is his father has just passed away recently and he hasn't gone to the funeral, and so how much that influences um, his feelings when he first starts getting close to Chester and sees him, and, um, you know, and I, but I love how you never really know who's telling the truth. You know, he says, oh, he reminds me of my father, but, you know, how, how is, is he kind of just saying that off the cuff to this woman, or is he does he really go there? Uh, the, the, there's a lot of the these complications that she writes in, which are so great. Kirsten, I'm guessing it wasn't too horrible to work with these two gentlemen. But <laughs> hey, how about me? <laughs> it wasn't horrible to work with me either. But I, but I, I want to congratulate you. <laughs> Okay, yes. But I, okay. I thought it was impressive that you and Haas together made this character a lot more, if I may say, more complicated and sympathetic than she is in the original book. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered how important it was to you to shape her in that kind of way or if, if, if you're just more interested in serving the story as a whole. Well, for me, I first read the script and I felt, I, I, it was one of the best written materials I've read in a long time, which, you know, it's very hard to come across a well-written script. So for me, it was the first the story that appealed to me, and Vigo was attached, and I had talked to Haas, and at first, he, I know he was thinking about maybe casting someone a little younger than me. Because to have that innocence, maybe, or the, the flightiness of a man, a, a woman who married Rich, but really, what was more interesting is, is creating, like, a real dynamic between us, a real husband and wife. And yes, she's delusioned by, you know, a little bit by the money and the glamour, but I think that Colette truly loves Chester, and in order to make this dynamic interesting, we needed to have a more, you know, more filled out woman, rather than, you know, just you know, the girl in the film. That's not interesting to me, and I don't think it's interesting for anybody else to watch either. Vigo, in such a tense or intense psychological drama, especially the first half where we're really learning the duplicitous sides and the different sides of these characters, did the three of you actually, or the four of you, talk through it a lot, or did you just dive in there? No, Haas, I mean, Haas did uh, something that I was, you know, more directors would do. He got all of us together a month, or maybe it was five weeks or something, maybe almost a month and a half before we started shooting here in London, and so that we could talk about things, things that, you know, questions about, you know, the, the two, 
three different relationships and how far he wanted to go with each one, what initial ideas he had, and that, I don't know, it made, I think that we felt more comfortable because we could ask questions and say, well, I'm not so comfortable with that, or, you know, and out of those discussions he thought a lot and, and changed certain things, and by the time we started shooting it was a lot easier than if we had just shown up and tried to wing it, you know. Because uh, it is, I mean, I think it's one of those movies that's, it's rare these days in that it's quite subtle, you know, it's, uh, and because it's subtle there's a lot of things that if, you, if you're, I don't know, if you're the type of person that's seen lots of movies, that's a, like you see movies all the time, you can miss little things because people don't, it's like a classic, uh, you know, thriller noir movie, really. And a lot of the behavior, a lot of the reactions are, are really subtle and just the tone of the film, the music, the way it's shot, all those things. What's great about it is that when you see it a second time, you see even more things about the characters and their, the complexity of their relationships. Most movies aren't that way. Most movies you see it a second time, you go, eh, it wasn't as good as I thought. And then you start to see flaws. Here it's the opposite. So it's a delicate thing, and it was really good. I think, at least I'm speaking for myself, it was really good to be able to talk through as much as possible before we started. Because it wasn't, it looks like a super like a relatively a big budget movie and a very rich kind of looking movie, but we didn't have lots of money compared to other movies that look this way, or time to shoot, and we were moving around a lot, and it was good to have a lot of things talked through before we started. It was the most extensive pre-production like, uh, I've ever really done as I far as I was going to say, it's very rare. Some people don't... Um don't give the time, don't, don't write in the time class. Yeah, well, I think that's what I was very much interested in. I remember you came out to New York yeah, and we sat and mm -hmm. for two days and just went over the script and I just got to ask you know, line by line, all right, what is this? Okay, what is this? What's here? Is yeah. this possible? This? And then the, then that was one of the things we did. And then, like Vigo said, a uh, month after that, we all got together and got to just kind of figure it all out. And that's it's because of that I think that we were able to really create so much so much nuance and layer it and um, not feel we needed to show you know not just kind of get in there and just be like yeah here's the character I hope this works but we really got to to play with um, together yeah together and subtleties not too many uh, writer directors were that open about their scripts either you know mm -hmm. I mean especially the first time you know, someone who's lived for years and and fine-tuning the script all along, and and all of a sudden things change as you're shooting. But if you're smart, like Haas is, uh, you're open to changing things. I mean, many times it was his idea. We'd be shooting and go, you know, it's 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 nicely written that part. If I say so myself, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I would know this. But I said, no, this works. It's nice on the page, but but maybe I think you guys seem to be able to you'll sounds, the scene works better without that bit, and uh, not many writers, most writers, writer-directors are pretty defensive about their words, you know, and uh, I think that was really smart on his part, and it was helpful to us, because it's better to do it then than to later have it happen in the editing, or it just doesn't work somehow, what you're trying, you're forcing something to work that doesn't, and he was really smart all the time, and humble about it. Thank you. thank you. Okay, let's open it up. Who'd like to ask a question? Yes, Simon. First of all, thank you so much for making a film about realistic characters with a real story, real locations, great running time, fantastic film. You can stay. <laughs> but also, could you tell us a little bit about the logistics of working on those locations? Is there anything you particularly enjoyed about being there? Anything that was a culture shock, like the shellfish, for example? Did you ate <laughs> I got sick for sure. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. Really <laughs> sick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it Everything <laughs> solved in Greece by drinking Rocky, I feel like. Yeah. Everyone just gives you, like, remember plastic bottles? Thank you yeah. for coming to our restaurant. Here's a plastic bottle full of Rocky. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't need this. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was, I mean, it was, with four locations? We had four locations that yeah. were moving around. Vastly different. And, and some of them we couldn't, like the Acropolis, we had two days to shoot and we had to get out of there. So if we didn't make our days, and we were just like spending time looking at clouds and stuff the whole time and worrying. And also there was uh, the riots going on. And the riots. At the exact same time that we were there. Yeah. 
So like I finished shooting and then wandered out to see where all the tear gas was coming from. You see people just <laughs> running the opposite way with uh, yeah, you know, masks on. That was pretty. It was, I mean, it, was, it was great starting in Creed as well because you were literally in this beautiful town in, mm. in Hahn, you're in, and, and everyone would walk to work and, and we'd all sort of you know bump into each other on weekends and stuff. So I think it created a sort of harmony on set. And and you know the great thing about these three actors is they are totally mixing with everyone and, and there's none of that. You know, we were all sort of very much a team with the crew and everything, and it was it was great to start off like that because by the time we got to Istanbul and then Athens, it, we were in big cities again, so it was harder. But it was a great bonding thing to start in Crete, yeah. and we shot completely out of yeah. sequence. And we could swim after. Work. I mean, the sea was right there, so it was amazing on the weekends. Or actually, we had one day off, right? Didn't we on this one? <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. We suffered a lot. We only got to swim once a day in the Mediterranean. Yeah, we only got one day in the Mediterranean. I'm one of those people who did for, get to see, was lucky enough to see the film three times. I saw oh, it. Wow. Be and after the first time, I read the book. And I have to say that for me, if I ever taught a film adaptation class, I would use that because I thought what you did with the book to make it mm -hmm. more, the tension and, and to make it more cin cinematic was absolutely, but still getting all the points in and all the relationships in, was so creative and imaginative and fabulous that that's why I went to see the film another time to see how it worked. I mean, the, it was better than Thank you, but I, th I think that she's in a, I mean, I, in, in her, I, I don't think you can do that as a screenwriter unless you have three brilliant characters at the heart of the book. And I think that's what yeah. Ray Smith is so great about, you know, that's what I love about it, is, is I think she transcends the crime genre, and she's a great writer. And it's not one of her best, but I think she just creates characters. I mean, I could never have come up with that sort yes, of... Yes, but can I give an example of what you did for people that, um, that... Uh, it, for the for cinema audiences, improved it. For example, um, we don't know until um, the um, detective comes in, and even afterwards, and well, in, until Camille until Camille says, um, uh, "I thought you said we weren't going to be followed." That there was he had a shady past, whereas in the book we know right from pay, the first paragraph. So okay. there's more of this. Wow, uh, we see how we see the two faces right away. And also, um, your ca your character was was not a wheeler dealer in the book. Mm -hmm. He was completely straight. Mm -hmm. But making him a little bit of a wheeler dealer made the father son relationship, which couldn't be stream of consciousness like in the book, much more. That was that was largely with Oscar. That was something that that's what I mean. What's great about collaborating with actors is is a lot of those things came out. We talked about that, and, mm -hmm. and he was interested in that, and the, the script changed and. I think one of the great privileges on this movie was um, was all the meetings that Leo is describing is, and, and, and with Kirsten as well, she'd sort of suddenly say, well, like, let's change this and that. And, that and, it, and it sort of, for me as a screenwriter, I think the collaboration with actors is so valuable. Mm. And, and it's a bit of a thing I moan about now, but it's a, that, that some directors, like Nicholas Reffin on Drive is fantastic because he completely involved me in that process. But others keep you out. And I think whilst being very respectful to directors that I work, you know, I think if they're confident, they give you that freedom to work with the actors. And I find they're often the best collaborators in developing a part for a screenplay. And, and I know my writing gets better, and so in this case got better by spending a lot of time talking to the actors. Well, can I just ask one thing though about the, the, um, the title? I mean, they go in the book, they go there in January because, um, and you're not very happy about that, <laughs> because they're on the run and they ha can't choose mm -hmm. when to go. So in the f film, and I appreciate it because it's much more, it's nicer to look at sunny Greece than freezing cold Greece. But what, what about keep, keeping the title, The Two Faces of January? Were you worried I, I, about that? No, because I, the thing I loved about the idea of the, the, the January is the two-headed god. And yeah. there, there were things yeah. about the fact that but he's a god with the head. The heads are joined, but they're mm. facing in different yes, directions. Yeah. And I thought that was very much symbolic of Chester and and Rydell, that, mm. that they hate each other and, and they're fighting over Colette. <laughs> but they're somehow, and largely because of Colette, after Colette dies, they're sort of they're they're drawn to each other and they're they, they're almost they can't escape each other. And it's mm. whether it's through guilt or uh, shared love of her or whatever, they're, they're tied. And yeah. I think the other thing was the, the January, the god, you know, it's it's the old. Oh 
get, you know, giving way to the new and the whole notion of the Greek myth of, of the, the son needs to kill the father in order to become a man. Mm, and okay. I thought that rite of passage yeah. was very much Rydell's story. And, and, and it sort of, so I, I felt that despite losing the January aspect of it, which was largely to do with heat and sun and trying yeah. to... But, but I felt symbolically that, that and it's a tough title, but, but it, I think, I think it's because you have to explain it, but I think it's, uh, to me, it says a lot about, you know, what the film is about. Yeah. Dramatically. Okay, thank you, sir. Hi, for Vigo and Oscar, in the father-son relationship that's sort of hinted at throughout the film, did you feel that both the characters accepted this in the end with, with Chester sort of taking the blame for Colette's death and Rydell attending his, his funeral? That sort of accepted, you know, they're similar they, characters. They, they and accepted that we acknowledged that there was like a father son? Yeah, throughout the film as well. That, that sort of bond sort of unified you together. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I mean, I think that, and that's very high Smith, the characters constantly surprise you. You know, all three of them do or say things or have ways of looking at each other or reacting that are not consistent with what you might normally expect in this kind of movie. Her characters are, are messy, their relationships are messy sometimes. It's embarrassing to watch something they do. I mean, we were, I think, under Haas's guidance, we were trying to get that feel. It's, it's a really classy looking movie, you know, and the way the clothes and the way the whole presentation is initially, but there are a lot of moments that are strange or and there are moments increasingly where the characters don't act in their own best interest, where they surprise you, or so. Well, what, what happened to her? Well, wait a minute. What's now? What you know? And just these—that's just Highsmith, and that's one of the reasons that this book. Uh, you know, she had a hard time getting it published initially. It was uh, probably the book she had the most trouble with. It. I think it was ready in '62, and her publisher rejected it. She kept rewriting and rewriting, and finally the guy said, "I'm not going to publish it. It's just too." I mean, the very reasons the publisher gave. It's messy, you know. What, what was the quote? You can have two. It was, um, you, a, a book can take Dick's two neurotic characters. Two neurotic characters, three. not three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's something messy about that, about the whole thing, unexpected, you know, and the behavior. And that was the very thing that two years later, when it was published, the praise she got, and she got some, a couple of awards, I think, for that book, was precisely for that. It's like it's very human. It's, it's that's seemingly erratic, unexpected thing is very human. You don't know. It's, it's the way life is. You never know what's around the bend. And, and I, as an actor, I like the fact that the characters, all of them, have moments that you're kind of embarrassed for them. You could even read it on the page and like, Ugh. and then in doing it, there's just things that happen that are just, mm, yeah, it's not your best look, you know, or it's, you know, it's not, don't say that, or don't, don't, express, don't show that, you know what I mean, that discomfort or that jealousy or, Whatever each of the three of us did, there are moments that are not—they're not attractive, you know. And that's the way her characters are. I like that, you know? especially because, as you said, that Hoss started out, he had the characters look, you know, fairly glamorous. You know, you're in the sunshine on a hilltop. All three of them start up there, and you end up, you know, for you, you end up in the dark down on the ground. I end up in the dark and the rain on the ground. It's kind of like. Like the labyrinth, you know, it's Find a spiral. The cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's Comedy. unusual. It's Comedy. Unusual. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry, apologize, uh, apologies in advance if I pronounce your name wrong. Hollis. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm curious about your shift from writing to directing. Was, was that always your long term plan, or did you feel it was necessary to, um, to convey your vision accurately? And second to that, how did you end up in the driver's seat for the two phases? Um, I, I sort of, actually when I read it at university I assumed I'd leave and I'd be direct, writing and directing and suddenly they just didn't happen for years. I didn't get a job for, didn't work and you know when I got something, when I finally got hired to write something it never got made and, and when I did it was you start, you become a screenwriter I think in this industry is once you're one thing it's very hard to do both unless you start off being a writer director. But you know I, I sort of, this was the book I wanted to do and this is the one I tried to get done for 20 years or whatever. Um, and. I sort of, by the time I did it, I'd stop. I, I, th I think it's that the work becomes more important than I want to be a director. You know, that's what I started off as. I want to be a director. I want to be this. And that. But it, it's um, and it happened because, really, because you know, Vigo and, and then Oscar Custin just said they were happy for me to direct. Because I think it's 
you know, I'm sure it made a lot of people nervous a first time director and stuff, but I, I didn't really ever get treated, they never treated me like a first time director. The, the crew didn't either, and nor did the producers and financiers. But, but I think it was, it was just, you know, the fact that you need support. I don't think you can just suddenly, you know, especially having been a writer for so long, if they, if they hadn't agreed to let me direct, I would have probably said, you know what, I'm happy for somebody else to direct and I'm happy to write it. Just, just to go back, did you approach the producers with the, the concept or how, how did that come about? Sorry. Well, I, yeah, it was a book that I, 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 I approached a series of producers over a long, long all, over those years and stuff, and eventually Tom Stumbo, one of the producers here, who had the rights, got involved, and then uh, Working Title got involved, and, and then and once those Anthony Mingala and Sidney Pollock were going to produce it, and very sadly passed away. So it was, a lot of people just, you know, I was very lucky because they believed in me and, and they believed in, in the book. Am I missing anyone shy in the back? Oh, you're in the front, go ahead. <laughs> Firstly, I just want to congratulate you, Oscar, on your Greek pronunciation. It's spot on. I'm sitting there thinking, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> me, I sound cockney when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Kirsten, I wanted to ask you about Colette. Um, she, she appears to be possibly the most innocent of the three, even though she's aware of what Chester's done. And you mentioned how she's in love with her husband. There's that scene when you guys are getting drunk, well, he's getting drunk, um, and she, she knows he's paranoid about Rydell um, and, the, and the way he looks at Colette, and he's a younger man, not bad looking. Um, <laughs> do you, she, she almost, she spends so much time in that scene being attentive to him and almost ignoring her husband. Is she looking for a way out already, do you think? And he's the way out, or? I don't think Colette's innocent. I don't think so at all. I don't think he would be with the two mm. innocent of a woman. I think he, she knows what he does, she just doesn't, she doesn't need to know all of it. Mm. You know, I don't think it's innocent, I think it's just turning, a, turning an eye. And, and that's kind of something I think that in the 50s, like, was okay and acceptable, and I don't know what feelings you're having, but it's none of my business. And I think, you know, before that scene, you get little pieces of him starting to unravel and starting to, there's something on the boat before that where, you know, he's already saying that he's just coming with us because he, you know, thinks I'm cute. And we have already had that dinner and there's mm -hmm. already been that tension. So I think I'm pushing his buttons because, you know, he's pushing mine and we wouldn't be in this situation if it weren't for him. Mm -hmm. So I think I, you know, like any jealous boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever, you know, you, you kind of want to stick it back to them and that's my way of sticking it back to him. Oh, yes ma'am, back at the back. Um, Kirsten, it's always a shock when a main character dies halfway through the film. How did you feel when you were like, um, a little more than halfway, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how much did you cut out of <laughs> But the plot of films like, reached its big conclusion and a big climax. So how did you feel when you first read the script and saw her, your character die? God, I didn't even think of... I, well, right now, all I'm having flashbacks is I remember that day because Vigo is holding my body and he's grieving. And he had a, he had to have a lighter on because because to like illuminate the darkness of and yeah. to illuminate what was happening in the scene. And, <laughs> and he's holding my body. He lays me back down, and I'm being burnt. But I just like, <laughs> the scene. I was like, okay. Yeah, the lighter didn't go out. was lying next to arms. Yeah. It was like kind of like oh my god. I still yeah, have I'm a little scar on my arm. Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, that's the first thing that came to my mind about that scene, is, is taking one for the team. And you did. I did take one for you. But she's dead, why are tears rolling? <laughs> I think when I first read the script, I thought, you know, this is what happened. You know, it was kind of like, this was a boiling point of what, you know, you're destroying the light in your life. It was the, you know, the, that was the symbolism, I think, of, of what happened. It's quite shocking when I read it. I, didn't, I was pretty shocked. Yeah, yeah when oh, I read yeah. the book, I had the same thing. Yeah, as a know. woman, I wasn't shocked. But you guys, I wasn't shocked that she died. I don't know why when I, I read this. When, when I read the book, I definitely had that feeling of, right. um, you know, and it was actually one of the hardest challenges. It was actually sort of just, particularly, you know, with you in it, I think there's no expectation of mm. too much of that yeah. character. And it's suddenly, the, you know, but, but I think that's the sort of writer she was, where, yeah, perverse. where <laughs> just, just goes and. <laughs> 
and and just hits the dark. You know, she, she just goes after the darkness in those kind of moments and things. And and, and no, but I was thrilled you actually wanted to do it because there was like. It is it's sort of one of those parts that just stops. Did time. he like accidentally only send you like seven? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the end is really good too. But I like this part. Uh, I, I really, I love the script so much. I wanted to be a part of a, a good film. Mm -hmm. I think that's all you really want. Because all you have is the experience as an actor. You don't know what happens at the end of the day to the film. If it's mm -hmm. great, then we all get to celebrate together and have a wonderful time and have mm -hmm. that extra thing together. But that's, yeah, that's all you have as an actress. And I had a wonderful time working on this film with all of them. And don't mention she dies in the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, sir, back there. 